Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. All right. Well, good afternoon. Welcome. I'm Kevin Schofield. I'm here to introduce and welcome Sir Ken Robinson, who is visiting us as part of the Microsoft Research Visiting Speaker Series. He's here today to discuss the element, how finding your passion changes everything. Covering such topics as the power of creativity, circles of influence, and attitude and aptitude, Robinson stresses the importance of nurturing talent along with developing an understanding of how talent expresses itself differently in every individual. He defines the element as the point where the activities individuals enjoy and are naturally good at come together. In his book, Ken demonstrates a rich vision of human ability and creativity, showing that age and occupation are no barrier. Sir Ken Robinson is an internationally recognized leader in the development of innovation and human resources. In 1998, he was invited by the UK government to establish and lead a national commission on creativity, education, and the economy, and his report, All Our Futures, Creativity, Culture, and Education, was published to huge acclaim. He was a central figure in developing a strategy for creative and economic development as part of the peace process in Northern Ireland. And the resulting blueprint for change was adopted by all parties across the province. He was knighted by Queen Elizabeth in 2003 for his achievements in creativity, education, and the arts. And in 2008, he was awarded the Peabody Medal for outstanding contributions to cultural relations between the US and the UK. Please join me in welcoming Ken Robinson to Microsoft to discuss his new book. <clears throat> Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for coming. Um, do you have nothing better to do? Is that <laughs> I mean, it always looks like this is a diligent piece of research, isn't it? But hey, it's an hour at the office, so welcome. Um, uh, you're meant to say how delighted you are to be where you are, aren't you, at the beginning of these things? Uh, I don't know. <laughs> um, I live in LA, California, and I left Britain to get away <laughs> from the climate that you're now enjoying in Seattle. So it's a muted pleasure, frankly, to be among you. Um, I wish I weren't. <laughs> but, <laughs> but there it is. That's what happens when you write a book. Um, actually, uh, I moved to Los Angeles, when was it, nine years ago, um, with my wife and our two kids. Uh, actually, we moved to Los Angeles uh, thinking we were moving to America. <laughs> Have you been to Los Angeles? <laughs> really, um, Frank Lloyd Wright once said that if you were to turn the world on its side and shake it, everything loose would end up in Los Angeles. <laughs> and we did. Uh, we were loose. <laughs> Have you been to Las Vegas? <laughs> what is that? Really, I mean... <laughs> Uh, we were there recently, my wife and I. We got married again. <laughs> it was her idea. <laughs> but can you blame her? I mean, really. <laughs> I mean, come on, what would you do, really? Uh, no, we've been together for 33 years. And three years ago, it was our 25th wedding anniversary. I know, you're working it out now, aren't you? Yeah, but <laughs> there were five fairly torrid years, frankly. <laughs> We're trying to make our minds up. But uh, my wife is a major fan of Elvis Presley. Now, I say that as if it's a neutral comment, you know, but it's hard, really, to overemphasize the extent to which that is an understatement. Do you clear something up for me here? When we moved to America, we found that... Are there any people here from England, by the way? Hi. You just lost, or are you working here? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Dreadful sense of direction. Yeah. I read exactly. Yeah. There are some interesting, subtle linguistic differences. You know, one of them is the word "quite." In Britain, I'm right about this. Aren't I? Quite means not very. It means moderately, reasonably. You know, it's quite warm. It's not a big deal. It's quite warm. Um, in America, it means very, doesn't it? And I didn't know this. I, I came to America, and I. I was uh, at the Getty Center. That's why I came over. And I, 
uh, invited a, a group of people for lunch, um, I think my second week there. And I host them and it was rather sensational, I felt, you know. And the next day, I got an email from the person who had led the delegation thanking me for the quite interesting lunch. <laughs> <laughs> I thought, well, you're not coming back. That's the situation, really. <laughs> That's it. I hope you enjoyed it because it was your last lunch at, at the Getty. Uh, we were told other things, by the way, before we moved to America. We, we were given a guide by our relocation agent. And it was a cultural guide. And the, it was entitled, How to Behave in America which some people see as a contradiction in terms, don't they? But <laughs> it's... <laughs> since there are no standards. But <laughs> no, no. no, there are, there are. Um, but it said things like, uh, when you go to America, don't use irony. It says, Americans don't get irony. This isn't true. We've lived here now for nearly 10 years, for what we now know people in America call a decade. Uh, I say this because when you go to Los Angeles, um, everybody uses the term decade a lot. They do. I think because it sounds like a really long time. <laughs> Doesn't it? In Europe, a century is not a big deal. <laughs> it's not. People don't get excited about centuries. It, I mean, our house in England was, was built in 1830. And that was one of the newer developments in the area. You know, we'd... <laughs> Whereas in LA, anything that's been up for 10 years is a heritage property. Isn't it? When I first arrived in America, uh, in LA, there was a, a commercial on the radio. I mean, there have been many since. I'm sure you've heard some of them, but there was, <laughs> it wasn't just the one. But, uh, but this particular one, it struck me as a really interesting attempt for LA to get a sense of tradition. Yeah, I think it was for Saab of Santa Monica. I'm not completely sure. But, uh, but it said, uh, I was on the, on the 405, and I heard this thing come on. And it said, whatever the company was, uh, proudly serving Los Angeles for almost half a decade. <laughs> I thought, half a decade? It, what, four years? <laughs> Not actually a decade, you know. I was in Beijing a while ago and uh, at an event for, well, and the hotel had two restaurants, a Chinese one and an Italian one. Which one are you going to go to, by the way, in Beijing? Really, <laughs> truthfully. We're going to trust, you know, the pasta or the noodles. You know, so I, anyway, th I had this uh, fantastic meal. It was a steamed garupa fish. And um, they brought it to me flopping around alive in a basket before they gave it to me. I don't like that. <laughs> I'm British, you know. <laughs> I do not like to be introduced to my entree, you know. <laughs> I don't know. Like, give it to me. Because I knew if I said I liked it, they were going to go and execute it, you know. I'm a pacifist. You know, I, I don't like to feel a bit being slaughtered in my interests. You know, anyway, so I, I kept talking for a while, and I, and I ate it. But uh, it came back about ten minutes later with this really irritated expression on its face, you know, and covered in, <laughs> and, uh, in onions. But she said, um, to keep her talking, because I didn't want to eat it, uh, she said, how's the food? I said, it's fantastic. I said, mind you, I love Chinese food. And she said, well, you know, thank you, but this isn't really a Chinese dish. I said, is it not? She said, no, no, no. She said, this method of cooking fish was introduced into China by the Mongols 900 years ago. So this could be a fad. <laughs> what do you mean? In, in Chinese terms, who knows this is going to catch on? You know, really, it's, it's barely a millennium. You know, it's, it's like nouvelle cuisine. You know, in, I say this because of these extraordinary cultural differences. The sense of time is one of them. Um, but so when we got to America, we were told these things, like, you know, there were some interesting cultural differences, like the word quite, and, and don't use irony. And I, we said, OK. This is not true, by the way. I mean, I've traveled all over America, and everyone I ever met in America gets irony, as much as anybody else does. It's one of those urban myths, you know, like the British are reserved. You know, we're not. We're lovely. I'll say, but, but <laughs> and so open, you wouldn't believe it. Um, anyway, we believed it. But they, they gave us uh, some other advice in this book, How to Behave in America. The other one was, uh, don't hug Americans. Honestly, it said this, Americans don't like to be hugged. So don't hug them. I was, okay. Weird, you know, but we won't do it. So, you know, we feared one day hugging people ironically, you know, like... <laughs> What would they make of it? 
So we didn't. So we were going to these receptions that had been organised by the Getty, you know, me and my wife and two kids, and we were like this. You know, people would come towards us and we'd stiffen, all four of us in a row, like that. We were like refugees from Riverdance, you know, we're kind of <laughs> like that. And, and you could see people thinking, oh, look, that's that British Reserve thing, you know. <laughs> of course it's not, and we found out since people like to be hugged and we hug people all the time at random now in, <laughs> in the street. And, and they don't like it, really, is what we're finding out. But, but there are these subtle cultural differences, and there's a reason you'll be interested to know for me telling you these things. But one of them is, when I say I can't um, overemphasize my wife's interest in Elvis Presley, uh, one of the things I find in America is people don't say overemphasize, they say underemphasize. Have you noticed that? I can't underemphasize this enough. I hear, is it just people speaking to me who say that? Or is it, <laughs> are people saying that all the time? Um, so Terry uh, has had this long relationship with Elvis Presley. Um, and there are already three of us in this marriage. <laughs> really. I mean, fortunately, I'm alive. <laughs> you know, but it's a marginal advantage, to be honest, really. It's 30 years, the same look of disappointment at breakfast. You know, it, <laughs> it wears you down, frankly. But we went to the Elvis Chapel to get married again. Uh, and I was invited as well, you know, so <laughs> it wasn't just her and Elvis. And I, so I mentioned it for a reason, which is this. If you've been to uh, Las Vegas, there's some seats here, by the way. You know this started at 11 o'clock, didn't you? <laughs> yeah. We're just wrapping up. Yeah. So thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Any questions? <on> <laughs> <laughs> no, if you think of it, there is no reason for Las Vegas to be there, is there? <laughs> to be where it is. If you were planning a city, you wouldn't think of the desert, you know, four miles drive from nowhere. Um, you know, there's a reason that Seattle is here. You know, it's in this kind of extraordinary delta. Um, an archipelago. There's a reason Los Angeles is where it is. There's a reason New York is where it is. I'm from Liverpool. It's a natural harbour. There's a reason. There is no reason for LA, uh, for Vegas to be there. It's the most hostile conceivable environment for human habitation. It's a desert. There's no natural water supply for hundreds of miles. The only reason that Las Vegas is there is because it exemplifies and has grown, by the way, exponentially. It's one of the fastest growing cities in the country. But the only reason it's there is because it exemplifies a capacity that only human beings possess. Uh, things happen in Las Vegas that only human beings do. You know? Um, I know, I, I didn't really mean to say it like that, but, you know, <laughs> but, I mean, I don't mean pole dancing, for example. I mean, although, it is true that other species do not pole dance. Isn't that true? <laughs> that is also uniquely human. Uh, dogs do not pole dance. They don't, actually. And you can't train them to do it either. <laughs> Trust me. On that, really. Trust me, it's a waste of a weekend, honestly. Really. Uh, actually, we don't have a dog. Now. <laughs> Got rid of the dog. Now, what I mean is the power of imagination. Uh, Las Vegas was a conception, and it's become compulsive for many people, but it's an ideas place. It's a place that has been made possible and overcome every natural disadvantage because people are sucked into this vortex of imagination and fantasy and possibility. Now, I don't ask you to approve of the idea of Las Vegas uh, or what goes on there, though you may, um, but simply to recognize that it represents this extraordinary human capacity. In fact, everything that's distinctive about human culture, and most things aren't, but everything that is, I believe we owe to this power of imagination. Let me say what I mean by it. What I mean by imagination is the power to bring to mind things that aren't present to our senses. The ability to step outside the moment, to step outside the sensory environment that we occupy and see in the mind's eye, forward and backwards and away and beyond. Once you have that power, um, you have access not just to the present, but to the past. 
are not just to any past, but to multiple possible versions of the past. I mean, history is such a contested discipline because the past is not a settled place. It's a contested place. Um, the contest in history is not over facts necessarily, but over what they mean, over interpretation, over context, um, over nuance. And imagination brings that to us. But it also gives us an infinite number of possible futures. We can dwell into the future, not any future, but multiple possible futures. I mean, the past isn't settled, and the future isn't still. It's a gift to us, if we want to take it. And this seems to me to be critically important, because we spend most of our time suppressing this power of imagination, or disapproving of it, um, or disparaging it. You know, referring to it's only imaginative, or it's all imaginary, it's only in your imagination. Now, I have a big interest in creativity, and you, you famously do, but creativity is not the same thing, in my view, as imagination. It's a step on, because you could be imaginative all day long and never do anything. You know, um, you could just lie in bed all day in your imagination. You would never describe somebody as creative who never did anything. To be creative, you have to do something. It's a practical process of bringing something into being. And to that extent, once you recognize that creativity is a transitive process, it means that you can facilitate it and teach it and make it possible. But as soon as you recognize, too, that it has its roots in imagination, it means that everybody is capable of it. And this is something I just want to get to in just a minute. So I think of creativity as the process of having original ideas that have value. Or you could say it's applied imagination. And I think it's of critical importance now, not to our well-being only, though it is for that, but to our survival. Because this power of imagination has brought this species to a brink. And, I mean, if we had never been on the Earth, the rest of the planet probably would have got on quite nicely without us. Uh, but we have brought things to a pass through this restless power of possibility and we'll only deal with it by not abandoning it or forsaking it or crushing it, but by facilitating it and growing it. And I say this because, in my experience, most adults have no confidence in their own creativity. Uh, most people think they're not creative at all, in my experience. They think other people are creative and, and they're not. I don't say that's true of you. You are Microsoft, you know. Uh, but Ask a cross-section of people at your next dinner party how creative they believe themselves to be, and I think you'll be depressed by what people tell you. And yet all children think they are wonderfully creative, up until a certain point. And the book, this, The Element, this extraordinary work, <laughs> which I cannot recommend too highly, frankly, honestly, you would be a fool not to read this book, um, is about some of this. What has struck me is this that most people that I know, um, not all, but very many people, just as one indicator of this, for example, don't enjoy the work they do. I don't say that's true of you. Uh, you probably love it. But an awful lot of people don't enjoy the work they do. And, and they also don't think they have any special ability to do anything much else, often. But they just get on with it. They endure it rather than enjoy it. But I also meet people who love what they do and couldn't imagine doing anything else. You know, if you were to say to them, look, don't do that anymore, they would be astonished and say, well, I don't know what you mean. I mean, this is not what I do. This is who I am. You know, why would I not do this? You know, that would be ridiculous. In a way, what they do defines them. They feel that they're most authentic when they do it. I mean, the common expression we use for it is they're in their element. And I have been struck by this for as long as I can remember. remember. And what interests me and what the book is about is what makes the difference? Why do some people have that experience and some don't? And what difference does it make when that happens to you? Uh, when you find this way of living that helps to define who you really are. But it relates to me to a bigger conception. I, I think of this as the other climate crisis. Uh, we've become used, I think, properly and, and correctly to there being a crisis in the world's natural environment. I think there's an equal crisis in the world's human environment. I mean, there are lots of, kind of indicators of it, you know, but not least, I think, one of them is the fact that until uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger made his recent State of the Union address, uh, California was set next year 
to spend more money on the state prison system than on the state university system. I mean, what conception of humanity does that answer to? You know, I just don't believe it. You know, I don't believe there are that many bad people out there. I mean, there are bad people, but there are few, but there are very many people in bad situations who can't quite see what to do with this, or the way out, and people who get trapped into bad situations. But I don't believe people are fundamentally bad. I don't believe there are that many psychopaths, you know what I mean? Actually, you don't need that many psychopaths, do you, if you think about it, really? <laughs> do you know what I mean? I mean, one goes a long way, don't you find, really? I mean, if you meet two psychopaths in the same day, that's a bad day, frankly, isn't it? Honestly, really. So the element is about that, and it relates really to these ideas. That, and I was, this is one of the reasons I was really interested to come here, and, and this is planned to be a conversation. I hope you know that, but uh, I just wanted to set my stall out a bit. What drives my work, really, um, in all the sectors I work in are three ideas. I work in education a lot, and I think education is, is the prime culprit at the moment in people not discovering what they're good at. I think so many people go through the whole of their education have no idea, as a result of it, what they're good at. Um, it, this isn't the fault of teachers or individuals or individual schools or school principals or school superintendents. I've worked in and around education most of my life and most of the people I know who work in education are passionate about what they do and are desperately anxious about the current state of affairs and don't want to be doing this stuff either. It's the system that's the problem. There is a system of education. The fact that it's a system is very important to understand. And it is systematically detaching the great majority of people from their natural talents. This is why so many people go through education and have no idea what to do now, have no idea what they're going to do. Worse than that, they go through it and think they're not really good at anything. So I work in education. I work in the corporate sector a lot. I work with organizations on ideas of innovation and creativity and what you can do to stimulate and, and harness creative capacities. And I work in the cultural sector, which is why uh, we moved across to the Getty when we came here. But the three ideas that course through my mind all the time are these. The first is, that, and you know this, I mean, the first is that we are living in a revolution. And I think if anybody doubts this, you know, they're not paying attention. I mean, the, there are challenges facing the world now which have no precedent in human history. None. I don't care where you look and when you look. I mean, there are moments, there are episodes, there are places which have been convulsed. I mean, the 18th century was pretty busy, you know, in terms of revolutions. Uh, the Chinese Revolution was a bit of a big deal, you know, the Russian Revolution affected us all. But this is global in its character and affects everybody inevitably every day. And it's getting faster. Um, so I want to say a couple, just a couple of words about that. The second is if we're to meet this revolution, and by the way, your industry is partly responsible for it, but if we're to meet this revolution, we have to think differently about ourselves, about our capacities, about what we're capable of. And the third point is, if we're to do that, we have to behave differently. We have to conduct ourselves differently. We have to run our businesses differently. And we certainly have to run our communities and our schools differently. The big problem in schools is we're still educating people for the 19th century, not for the 21st century. And we need a revolution in education, not something minor. Uh, I came across a great quote. But by the way, we moved our kids here when we came. I mean, that was only reasonable, we felt. You know, as we were leaving the country, we thought they should come with us. And uh, we put them into a, a local uh, high school near to where we live. We were very struck by the fact that the curriculum is very similar to the one that we'd left behind. With a few exceptions, there were some subjects that you teach in America. And by the way, we're permanent residents now. I'm thinking about citizenship, so you know, I, I feel I can speak as an insider. But um, there are some subjects you teach here that we don't teach in Britain. I think you'll bear this out. Uh, like American history. <laughs> We teach a version of American history <laughs> in which we won, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and then lost interest, you know. We <laughs> go on, you can have it anyway, we don't care. <laughs> Otherwise, we suppress it, the whole subject. We draw a polite veil across the whole horrible episode, really. Um, we arrived here, by the way, on June the 30th, four days before Independence Day. Uh, we had no idea. <laughs> I mean, get over it, really. <laughs> what a way to behave. I mean, people marching up and down, blowing trumpets and trombones and beating drums, waving flags to, to celebrate the English have left. <laughs> Do you know how that makes us feel? 
when, when we've just arrived. We've had to endure eight of these, though, and we're getting tired of it. Eight. We spend Independence Day indoors. We have done for the past five years. We close the, the, the shutters, light the fire, and look at old photographs of the Queen. You know, and, <laughs> and <laughs> wait for another year to pass. So, but with with those exceptions, the curriculum we found is remarkably similar uh, to the one that we left behind, and it's an old style education that's being offered, and one in which there is an un fettered belief in the power of standardised testing, which is destroying the spirits of half the country. Um, but people are locked into it. But I came across, I just want to read this quotation. Um, I came across a great quotation from um, Abraham Lincoln. Uh, you may know this, I, I hadn't come across this before, but uh, I thought it was a wonderful quote. Actually, I came across this one from J.K. Galbraith, which I was going to mention. Um, it seemed to me very resonant in the, uh, the context. The thing is, that you know this. One of our challenges now is that the future is not only unknowable, it's totally unpredictable. You know, we simply have no way of knowing how all these various forces are going to play out. As witnessed the last couple of years, you know, the meltdown, I came across this from J.K. Galbraith, who said, the only function of economic forecasting is to make astrology look respectable. <laughs> which I, which, I, which, I, which I, think, I think it does. But I, I came across this. This is from... Um, Abraham Lincoln. He said this the second annual message to Congress in December 1862. You remember what was going on in the 1860s in America. I, of course, have no idea at all because <laughs> we didn't get taught this stuff. But uh, doubtless there was a lot happening. No, but he said this, which I thought was wonderful. He said, and just think how resonant this is just now. He said, the dogmas of the quiet past are inadequate to the stormy present. The occasion is piled high with difficulty, and we must rise with the occasion. I like that, to rise with it, not to it. As our case is new, so we must think anew and act anew. We must disenthrall ourselves, and then we shall save our country. I just love that word, don't you? Disenthrall. You don't see it very often now. Um, but you know what he means, that we all of us live within frameworks of ideas and conceptions which guide our thinking and our behaviour. And many of the ideas that guide us most are ones we don't know we have. Uh, they're values and assumptions that we simply take for granted. They become part of our mental view of things. They're not the things we reflect on, they're the things with which we reflect. And another word for that would be ideology. It seems to me there's an important difference between theory and ideology. If you have a theory, you know what it is. And it is an explicit framework of ideas, and you can explain it to people and say, this is what I think is going on here. It's an explicit piece of exp explanatory apparatus. But ideology, to me, is different. It's the underlying assumptions on which we base the theories. You know, that great rift between um, the, uh, the medieval worldview and the modern worldview that was brought about by Copernicus and Galileo and others was not a change of theory, it was a, an ideological shift of an enormous magnitude. You know, up until Copernicus, it was generally believed that the sun went round the earth, and all astronomical theories were based on that assumption. The problem was that it was based on the idea of everything moving in perfect circles, and our being stationed at the middle, and of course it made sense to people, because it was obvious the sun was moving, it came up every day and went down, and it was obvious that we weren't. You know, people weren't being spun off the planet at, you know, random intervals or having to hang on to ropes to get to work. You know, it was obvious <laughs> it was moving and we were not. Plus, it tied in with the dominant religious view of, of the time that we were the centre of God's universe. So when Copernicus and Galileo then said, well, maybe... Because the astronomical theories weren't working. There were too many anomalies. They couldn't figure them out. They said, well, hang on. Try this as a hypothesis. What if the Earth was going round the sun? Then what? Well, all the old problems were solved. But a huge ideological problem was kicked up in the wake of it, which was, well, hang on, what does that mean? And it was really that shift that began the whole enterprise of the modern worldview, of revising our place in the universe. Now, what I'm saying is just that these, these ideas invade our minds and we don't know they're there. Another word for it is common sense. You know, we just think it's obvious. And there are a lot of things that we believe now 
in the early 21st century that we think are obvious in common sense, which are simply not true. Uh, but they, we are enthralled to them. I don't mean you personally, but as a culture, we're enthralled to them. So real innovation and creativity comes about from challenging what we take for granted, challenging common sense. The problem is that we don't know what it is that we take for granted, mostly, because we take it for granted. So let me ask you something you may take for granted. You may or may not, uh, but let me ask you anyway. Uh, firstly, how many of you here are over the age of 25? Okay, that's not what you take for granted, I'm sure. <laughs> how many of you are under the age of 25? Okay. So, um, those of you over 25, uh, could you put your hands up again, if you don't mind, if this isn't work? No, not yet. I haven't told you that. <laughs> <laughs> no, th there'll be a question first, obviously. <laughs> I know you can do it. You just showed me you can do it. <laughs> I don't need to be convinced anymore. No. All right, let me phrase this differently. <laughs> In a minute... <laughs> when I have asked this question, would you put your hands up in a minute? Um, if you're wearing a wristwatch, if you're over 25 and you're wearing a wristwatch. Okay. Now, those of you under 25, can you put your hands up if you're wearing a wristwatch? Okay. Now, you see the difference in proportion here. Um, broadly speaking, and by the way, if, if you speak to teenagers and ask them, how many of you have got teenage children? Do they wear watches? Well, one. Well, I'll tell you what's going on. The reason I'm saying it is this. Those of you who wore a watch today, did you think about it this morning? Was it like a big agony of indecision? You know, <laughs> shall I put the watch on again? I don't know. I mean, uh, did, I, did I consult it yesterday? I you know, did, did it come in? You don't do it. You just do it. I do it. I just put it on. Um, we do it because we take it for granted. Because we grew up in a world, ironically here, of course, that was pre-digital. You know, if you're over 25, the world you grew up, you were born into, was not a digitized world. Uh, it's what Mark Pensky calls it, it's between digital natives and digital immigrants. Um, you, know, you know what he means by that, it, 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 that if you're under 25, you were born into this world that was full of digital stuff, and so you speak digital. You know, kids are much more, I can't say about you, but much more efficient than most adults in digital culture. You know, I mean, if I'm online, I have one window open, you know. <laughs> And I'm thrilled with myself, you know, because it's, <laughs> it's my window, you know, and I, I, I sit and commune with it, you know. But my, my kids are online, they're 20 and 25, you know, they've got 10 windows open and they're downloading music and they're IMing and they're, they're on Facebook and they're mashing up music and the, you know, the telephone's ringing, the uh, television's on in the background, you know. I mean, I don't know if they're doing any homework, you know, but they're, they're running an empire, I don't care, frankly, you know, but... <laughs> But the reason kids don't wear watches, you know, is because it's, the time is on every digital device and they grew up with it. They take it for granted. They don't need to do this because the time is everywhere for them and it, it's not for us. Somebody once said this, you know, technology is not technology if it happened before you were born. And I feel that's true. I mean, when I grew up, you know, I didn't feel cars were some, like, fancy technology, you know. We all had them. We didn't go, oh, there's another car, you know. <laughs> that's a thousand today. Have you seen it? But my grandparents were rather struck by motor cars, you know. Uh, but I was rather struck by the fact you have a computer in the house. But my kids take it for granted that that, that should be the case. Uh, that's how the thing... My daughter never wears a watch. My son doesn't. You know, they're 20, 25, and they don't see the point. You know, my daughter's like, why would you wear a separate thing to tell the time? You know, like, like it's a one-function device. You know, like, how lame is that? You know... <laughs> And I said, no, no, it tells the date, you know, as well. <laughs> it, has, it has many functions. But you see, you, you might say, well, that, that's a kind of trivial example. It, it sort of is. But my real point is, what do we take for granted in other fields? Like about ourselves, for example. What are the things that are in our heads that we just take for granted about ourselves? Well, let me ask you another question for, that you may or may not. How many senses do you have? How many senses have you got? I'm going to come to you. Go on. Don't agonise. Come on, you must have an idea. Go on. Five. Five, OK. How, what are they? Smell, taste, touch, hearing, sight. <laughs> um, you keep quiet a minute. <laughs> are there any more than that? Any more? What? Does Omer a nasal uh, organ? <laughs> There's a thing in here that senses some other chemical that you can't consciously smell. Is this just your nasal organ we're talking about? <laughs> no, no, I saw it. Everybody's nasal organ. Oh, well, let's come back to that. I'll ask you about that. Is there, is there a sixth one? 
I'll come back to that. Vestibular. Hmm? Vestibular. Vestibular, okay. How about intuition? Yeah. People normally say that. Now, I'm going to come to you three in a minute. But you see, that's, that's stereotypically how we see it, isn't it? We've got five senses uh, and maybe intuition. But you see, there's a difference between the five, for example, and intuition, for example, because it's not, it's clear what does sight and hearing and smell. You know, if your eyes are compromised, your sight is compromised. We get that. It's not quite clear what does intuition. You know, intuition is a kind of spooky sense that girls have more of, isn't it? That's, that's the basic plan. But a physiologist will tell you, and by the way, I've had adults sit in a room for 20 minutes trying to come up with some more senses, and they don't. But a physiologist will tell you, you have at least nine real senses. Uh, the vestibular sense, which is like the sense of balance, which is moderated by the inner ear. If that gets damaged, you can't function. You can do better without sight than you can do without your sense of balance. I mean, if that were taken away from you, you couldn't get in the room, you couldn't leave it. You know, if that gets compromised by alcohol or, as it may well, you know, or disease, it's a catastrophe. I don't know about this nasal one. I'm very interested to hear that. What you, you put up for nine. Did you have some more? I read the book. You read the book. Good man. <laughs> well, you know, t temperature, for example, is a totally different sense from touch. You can be hot or cold without touching anything. Pain is different from touch, again. Well, you can go on, and then you think of all the somatic senses, like appetite, what happens if you become frightened, how emotions play against your physiology. And my only point is that to say we have five senses is the most impoverished conception you can imagine of the subtlety and complexity of our human being. But most people th take it for granted we've got five senses, uh, and the reason is we've heard it said so often We've got five senses since we've been kids. It's a closed question. We don't think about it anymore. Like you say, how many senses have you got? Oh, I've got five. No, you don't. Um, but if, if we take even our basic physical apparatus in that way, what, are we, what about our intellectual capacities? What about our spiritual and emotional capacities? How much do we misconceive or underestimate those? So the book is partly about that. It's to say that if we're to meet this revolution in which we all uh, are engaged, we have to think differently about what we have. And we have to enrich our sense of ourselves. And I believe it's vital for these reasons. It's vital for personal reasons. I cannot see any good reason why we should live our lives. I mean, I don't know how often you think you're going to come back, you know, or how long you think you're going to be here. Uh, that's a matter of faith and religion. You know, we're not here to talk about that. But, but we know we're here now. Um, I can't see any good reason why people would willingly submit to a life of drudgery and dreariness that they could avoid or do things they would rather not do if they had some alternative way of thinking about themselves. That you would avoid a life with purpose and meaning and fulfillment without testing you know, the real proposition. I think it's essential for the health of our communities because we have so many people disengaged from any real sense of purpose. Take one example. 30% of kids in America do not graduate from high school. 30%. That's 50% in some of the uh, low-income communities and as high as 80% in the Native American communities. That's a catastrophe. <coughs> you know, that's a whole generation who are going to take over in 10 years' time, over half of whom have no engagement in their own process of education. That's unprecedented in the history of this country. You know, so what, how is that going to play out? And it's also vital for economic reasons. You know, as good as or as better than anybody else, that any company these days has to live on the edge of innovation continually if it's to have even a sense of keeping pace, let alone uh, succeeding. And I believe that the real future for companies is harnessing this extraordinary pool of talent, much more than we have in the past. So to me, the element is about both a personal story and it's a global issue. And I just want to kind of give a couple of indicators, then we'll open this up. To be in your element, it seems to me, is two things. Um, the first is this, that uh, if you're in your element, in that kind of common way that we use the term, you're doing something for which you have a natural aptitude, like you get it in some way. One of the people I interviewed, actually I didn't interview, but one of the people who's in the book is a guy called Terence Tao. Do any of you know of Terence Tao? Have you heard of him? Terence Tao is a mathematician. Um, when I say that, I mean he's the mathematician, really. He's known as the Mozart of math. Uh, at the age of three, he taught himself to read by watching Sesame Street. 
uh, which is remarkable, and he has a rather curious accent, you know, as a result, but uh, <laughs> rather too fond of feathers for most people's taste, but you know. At the age of seven, uh, sorry, eight, eight, he took a college entrance math exam and got uh, 90%. At the age of 20, he got his PhD in pure math. And at the age of 30, he won the Field Medal for mathematics, which is equivalent to the Nobel Prize. It's reasonable to say, I think, that Terence gets math. You know, he's kind of, he's got the hang of it. Um, but he got it early on. You know, now, some people never do. You know, I didn't especially, I have to say. Uh, I was never very good at math at school. And uh, my daughter, till my daughter was uh, 10 or thereabouts, she thought I knew everything. You know, which is an impression it's very important to encourage, you know, among your children. <laughs> and uh, so she used to bring me home and math homework. And I would scythe through this, you know, like a math god, you know. And she'd look at me in amazement at how I pulled off these extraordinary calculations in simple addition mainly, you know. She'd, <laughs> she said, Dad, what is eight and four? You know, and without hesitating, I'd say, Kate, it's 12, you know. And she'd look at me in astonishment, wondering how I'd pulled it off. But then, uh, when she was about 12, she brought me home a page full of quadratic equations. And I remember the old familiar panic attack, you know. <laughs> so at this point, <clears throat> I introduced learning by discovery methods. <laughs> I said, Kate, there's no point in me telling you the answer. <laughs> this is not how we learn. And I say, you have to work this out for yourself. I'll be outside having a mojito. <laughs> and, and even when you've got the answer, there's no point in showing it to me. <laughs> this is what teachers are for. I do not wish to undermine their authority. So, and by these means, we survived. But she, she came home about three weeks later. Actually, she came home every night, honestly. But no, <laughs> but, <laughs> it wasn't like I sent her off and said, don't come back for three weeks. But, but she came back uh, a while later. She got a, had a cartoon strip. I don't know where she got it from, but we still have it. And there were three panels in it. And it was a, a father helping a daughter with homework. And the first panel, the father says, what have you got to do? And the daughter says, I've got to find the lowest common denominator. And the father said, are they still looking for that? <laughs> he said they were, they, were, <laughs> they were trying to find that when I was at school. I said, I know the feeling. Really. Terence has found the lowest common denominator immediately. He gets math. Now, other people don't, uh, but other people get gymnastics, you know, or they get the guitar, you know, or they get working with people, or they get drawing. You know, now, it seems to me such an obvious thing to say, but it is simply true and often forgotten that human aptitude is tremendously diverse. We take to things very differently. Now, this is really important because it's a very simple principle that our school system has totally ignored. Kids go to school and they are constantly being asked to do things they can't do very well uh, or being forced to do things they're not inclined to do um, and often being steered away from things they would love to do because it's not in the curriculum or it doesn't meet the dominant conception of intelligence and ability. A conception of ability which is predicated on the enlightenment conception of a certain type of rationality a certain type of academic work. So aptitude is the heart of this. We have to recast our sense of that. But it's not enough, I think, to be good at things to be in your element. Because I know lots of people who are good at things they don't really care for. To be in your element, you also have to love it. And if you love something you're good at, you kind of never work again at that point. You know, my brother used to be in rock bands. He still has, as a matter of fact. I have a lot of family. And um, I have seven. Well, we're seven. I have six siblings. But uh, years ago, I, went, I was brought up in Liverpool. I went to see in, in, at a gig, as we say, in the hip edge of the music business. And uh, I was gigging. And I was. But uh, they had this fantastic keyboard player called Chaz. And uh, he was brilliant. And we were having a drink afterwards in the bar. And I said to him, you, you were brilliant tonight. He said, well, thank you very much. I said, uh, I said, you know, I'd love to do that. He said, do what? And I said, you know, play the keyboards like that. He said, no, you wouldn't. Well, I was a bit taken aback, frankly, because, you know, I was just hanging out. You know what I mean? I wasn't there. <laughs> yeah, it's like a casual remark. I wasn't there to be interrogated, you know. But, but, uh, 
but you do, you hold your ground, don't you? You hold your <laughs> I said, yes, I would. And, you know, with my confidence weakening. And uh, he said, no, you wouldn't. And we went on in this way for some time. <laughs> I said, what do you mean, in order to break the deadlock? And he said, he said well, look, uh, I practice five hours a day and have done since I was a kid. And I perform six nights a week. And I love it. He said, I, I can only do that because I love it. He said, and if you loved it, you'd be doing it. He said, I think what you mean is you like the idea of it. I said, don't speak to me like that. I mean, <laughs> who do you think you are? But of course, it is true. If you love something, you overcome every obstacle. And you don't even think it's work to do that. And all the people I interviewed for the book combined those two things. They found something they loved that they also uh, had the aptitude for. One of the people I interviewed for the book is a guy called Bart Connor. Have you come across him? Bart Connor found when he was six that he could walk on his hands as easily as he could walk on his feet. I don't know how he found this out, <laughs> but he could. And I've seen him do it. You know, he just walks up and down as if he was walking on his feet, perfectly comfortably. And then he found he could walk up and down stairs on his hands as well. Well, it wasn't much use, you know, but it was <laughs> socially diverting. And <laughs> he said if there was a party at home and the conversation lagged, you know, his, his father would say, Bart, do the hands thing. <laughs> and the party would revive. <laughs> anyway, his mum, his mother, this in Morton Grove, Illinois, took him to the local gymnasium when he was eight, with the advice, the encouragement of the school. And he said he walked in the door, and he said it was like Disneyland and Santa's Grotto, all in one place. I said, why? He said, it was, oh, he said it was intoxicating. There were, ro you know, ropes, wall bars, trampolines, vaulting horse. He said it was really intoxicating. Well, I pause to ask you that. I mean, is that how you feel when you go into a gymnasium? Do you find it intoxicating? <laughs> I don't, you see. I need to get intoxicated, you know, <laughs> if, I, if I go into a gymnasium. But, but he loved it, and he went every day. Ten years later, he walked onto the mat at the Montreal Olympics, representing the United States in the male gymnastics team. He went on to become the most decorated male gymnast in American history. Um, he lives now in Norman, Oklahoma. He's married to Nadia Comaneci. You remember Nadia? Uh, the first perfect ten. Uh, they have a wonderful little boy, who's uh, I think two and a half now, called Dylan, after Bob Dylan. Why not Bob? <laughs> we don't know. It's what comes from spending a life upside down, frankly. But. Um, <laughs> And, and they have this amazing gymnastics. Uh, uh, they have this amazing gymnastics school. And he and Nadia are uh, on the board of the Special Olympics movement. So between them, they've helped to liberate the uh, gymnastic capabilities of thousands of athletes with special needs. Now, I say this for these reasons. Firstly, that his mother might have said at the age of six, "Bart, will you stop it with the hands thing?" Knock it off, you know, just get on. Our kids give us all kinds of signals about who they are and what they're disposed to and what engages them. And sensible parents encourage it. Often well-meaning parents discourage it because it doesn't sit with the conception of who these, what these kids should be doing. Now, I'm not arguing that we shouldn't do other things at school, that we should only follow our bliss, that we should never do things that require effort that run against the grain. But part of our purpose is to become who we are. And we become our best when we discover what it is we can do. And we have created archetypical pathways for people, many of whom simply rattle against the walls or drop off altogether and think, I want nothing to do with this. I mean, look at the levels of disaffection, disengagement, and despair that many people feel because they haven't found anything that resonates with who they are. But the other important thing about the Bart story to me is this. It illustrates something profound to me, which is that life is not linear. Our education systems are, but life is not. You know, when I went to school, the, the, the premise was if you worked hard and went to college and got a degree, you'd get a job for life. That was kind of true. You know, in the 70s, if you had a degree, you were guaranteed a job. The idea you wouldn't have a job with a college degree was ridiculous. I mean, 
The only reason you wouldn't have a, a job if you had a degree would be if you didn't want a job. And I left college in 1972, and I didn't want a job. I didn't. I wanted to find myself. You know, you could do this in the 70s fairly easily. <laughs> you know, so I decided to go to India, where I thought I might be. You know, and <laughs> I didn't get to India. I got to London, you know, where there are a lot of Indian restaurants. So I hung out there. But, <laughs> but I... But we still have people on this path. Like, the whole premise of our education system is you have to go to college. If you don't go to college, your life is over. And this is in the face of all the evidence of the contrary, that some people never want to go to college. Some people go to college and don't know what to do with themselves now. Some people rattle around the walls and go back home again to carry on playing video games. Um, some people go to college and love it. And actually, the whole system is designed for those few people, really, or that relatively small group. This obsession with college is really important, I think, to get our heads around. I was in Danville recently doing a book signing. I was signing a book. I didn't go to Danville, by the way, to sign one book. I mean, that would be pathetic. You know, it wasn't, it wasn't like they rang from the publisher and said, quick, somebody bought a book in Danville. You know, <laughs> we'll keep him talking. You know, you get here fast. A throng of books were being sold. Um, but I was talking to this guy. He was in his late 30s, I'd say. And I said, uh, what do you do? And uh, he said, I'm a fireman. And I said, well, how long have you been a fireman? He said, always. It's what I've always done. And I said, so when did you decide to be a fireman? He said, uh, well, uh, always. He said, I, I want to be a fireman from as soon as I got into elementary school. He said, actually, it was a problem because in elementary school, everybody wanted to be a fireman. <laughs> you know, he said, but I wanted to be a fireman. And he said, so when I got to the upper secondary school, into high school, in the junior and senior years, it was a big issue because um, everyone was applying to college. And the school was saying, which college are you applying to? Everyone had to go to college. He said, no, I didn't want to go to college. I wanted to join the fire service. And he said, I had this one teacher who ridiculed me in front of the whole class in the junior. He said, you know, you will never amount to anything. If you're throwing your life away, if this is all you're going to do to go and join the fire service, he said, you could really do, some do something. You could, you know, make something of yourself. He said, I was angry but also humiliated that that's what he thought. He said, anyway, I was thinking about it as you were speaking earlier. He said, because six months ago, I saved his life. He was in a car wreck, uh, and our unit was called out, and I pulled him out, and I gave him CPR, and I saved his wife's life as well. He said, I think he thinks better of me now. <laughs> you know. But you see what I'm saying? That we are born with this immense gift of diversity and imagination and creativity, but our, particularly our educational systems, have um, stereotyped it and stifled a great deal of it. And this is a process we can't allow to endure. So when people talk about getting back to basics, my argument is we should get really back to basics and say, well, what is it to be a person? What is it to be a human being? What kind of life do you want? What kind of life do you want for your kids? And then let's think about how we make that happen, particularly through the education system. Um, I mentioned Las Vegas. Not far from Las Vegas is uh, Death Valley. Uh, Death Valley to me is intriguing because it illustrates this. When I say human life is not linear, it is organic. I'll give you the worst example I can think of by way of linearity. When I got to LA, I saw a policy paper for public education 10 years ago which said, college begins in kindergarten. Now, I'm sure this is true in Seattle. I can't, I don't know for a fact, but I guess it's true. But all the major cities in this country um, are facing fierce competition from parents to try to get their kids into the right kindergarten. Kids are being interviewed for kindergarten. Interviewed. I mean, what are they looking for? <laughs> what? You know, signs of infancy. What <laughs> are they looking for? I mean... Presumably they're producing resumes with the help of their parents, you know, and sitting in front of these unimpressed selection boards, flicking over, the, you know, what, this is it? <laughs> you've, you've been around for 36 months and this is it? You know, you've, you've achieved nothing. You've spent, spent the first six, six months breastfeeding, what I can say. It's, <laughs> get out, you know, it's an outrage. See, it's preposterous, isn't it? But the whole idea is that it, it starts really from the point of conception, you know, People sitting with college entrance papers, you know, next to the bed. <laughs> How are you? I think, let's apply quickly, you know. 
Because the idea is they've got to get to the right college. But somebody, a friend of mine who runs the ARC Theatre in Dublin once said it beautifully, he said, you know, a three-year-old is not half a six-year-old. A six-year-old is not half a 12-year-old. They're three. Give them a break. You know, they're six. What our lives turn out to be is a function of what we become as we grow. And to me, therefore, a much better metaphor for human organisations is not industrialism, it's not manufacturing, it's agriculture. You know, human organisations like this one are often thought of in mechanistic terms. People talk about their functions, but, you know, a human organisation isn't at all like a mechanism. It's much more like an organism. You know, it's about relationships and feelings and values and motivations and all those things that make a life. And, you know, farmers know something important. They know that you can't make anything grow, you know. If you're a gardener, you cannot make a plant grow. The plant will grow itself. You know, you don't stick the leaves on and paint the damn thing. You know, it's, it grows itself. Your job is to create the conditions where that will happen. So Death Valley is a great metaphor for me because nothing grows there because it doesn't rain. In the winter of 2004, it rained. Uh, seven inches of rain fell on Death Valley. And in the spring of 2005, there was this phenomenon. The whole floor of Death Valley was carpeted with flowers. You can go online and check these things. And um, people came from all across the country to see this extraordinary sight. What it showed was that Death Valley isn't dead. It's dormant. No, but right beneath the surface are these seeds of possibility, waiting for the right conditions to come. And if the conditions come, life will follow. It's inevitable. That's how it works. And I think it's the same in companies like this one. It's the same in schools. It's the same in families. It's the same in communities. If you put people in a bad place in terms of conditions, they will react to it and hunker down and pull away from it. But, and you know it's true in your own life, but you give people opportunities to flourish differently and the whole place comes alive in a different way. And it's not your job to make them creative, it's to give them the conditions under which it's going to happen. And a big message really of the book is what that means in terms of individual talent. That's what getting back to basics means. It's kind of recasting our sense of talent. I came across, I'll just leave you with this, is a, 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 do you know the poet um, W.B. Yeats? Uh, my wife, I said, she's a great Elvis fan, and she's right to be, because he was fantastic. By the way, Elvis Presley wasn't allowed in the glee club at school <laughs> in Tupelo, Mississippi. They said he would ruin their sound. Elvis. Well, we all know what great heights the glee club went on to, you know, once <laughs> they'd managed to keep Elvis out. But uh, my wife, Terry, is also a, a major fan scholar, really, of W.B. Yeats, the Irish poet. And he, he just wrote this, which seems to me to speak this idea of imagination. It was actually a love poem to a woman called Maud Gon, who was his unrequited, lifelong love. And he was be bewailing the fact that he couldn't give her what he felt she really wanted. Uh, and what he could give her, she didn't really value. So he said this, Had I the heavens embroidered cloths, inwrought with gold and silver light, the blue and the dim and the dark cloths of night and light and the half-light, I would spread the cloths under your feet. But I, being poor, have only my dreams. I have spread my dreams under your feet. Tread softly because you tread on my dreams. And I think we should take it for all of us and for our children that our dreams, our imaginings, are what make us human. And we should tread softly. Thank you. <clears throat> yeah. Well, your hands up. Are you okay for time? Yeah, we're good. I mean, just leave when you need to. I mean, I... Well, thanks for. Or do you work. not have jobs to go to at all? Is this a whole? <laughs> <laughs> yes, go on. Sorry. Um, so, in reading the book, I, um, um, I mean, you opened up with just completely new way of looking at a lot of different things. So, yeah. uh, I'll say that at the beginning. At, at the same time, I was I was struck by um, by the, what asking myself what the next step would be, in the sense that understanding how we are um, limiting our ability to be to allow the various sort of modalities of creativity 
different types of creativity to be expressed, it occurred to me that another element that's missing, but another thing that's yeah. missing yeah. is creative creativity in service of what? Right. Meaning where uh, in this enthrall will be, uh, I will, <laughs> thank you for that too, uh, because I'll be using it, because we are enthralled with yeah. Of a certain approach now, and, and we have to somehow collectively or together determine what yeah. um, what we will be uh, putting our creativity and service to in order for us to to move forward essentially as a planet, because the, obviously the current tra trajectory is not sustained. And to in what context do you see those kinds of discussions happening about what it is that we that we put our well, creativity and service to? Well, <clears throat> the thing is that. That to me, a creativity essay is a is um, is a very practical process, and you can be creative at anything. It's one of the big problems is that we associate creativity with certain things, you know. Like so, we think it's all about the arts, um, or it's all about design or marketing. Um, you know, there are creative industries. I don't really like the term the creative industries <clears throat> because it suggests that some things are creative and others are not. I mean, categorically not. And the truth of it is, anything can be creative. And anything cannot be. You know, I know brilliantly creative mathematicians, brilliantly creative software developers, you know, brilliantly creative teachers, uh, very uncreative musicians, you know, also very creative musicians. Creativity isn't um, a particular activity, it's a way of doing anything. And we're all of us drawn to different things. You know, for some people, that what they're really drawn to is teaching and public service. Others are drawn to some of the careers that you've taken. So I don't want to, it's, I mean, it's not for me or anybody else to prescribe how people should spend their time. But I do know that the problems and challenges that we face are of a character and of a magnitude that we haven't dealt with before. Literally, you know, we could be a generation away from a catastrophe in terms of our use of natural resources. You know, the population has gone from 3 billion in 1970 to nearly 7 billion now. At the beginning of the Industrial Revolution, there were only 1 billion people on the entire planet. You know, at the height of the Renaissance, you know, there were fewer people, you know, living in Rome and Florence than in Seattle. You know, it, it's hard to picture the scale at which things have ramped up. And you know, in your industry, how quickly the technology is shifting. I don't suppose anybody here really who could say confidently where the technology is going to be 10 years from now. Can you? I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, but I guess that's true. Let me ask you this, by the way. I mean, it, you might be able to help me on this. I'm sure you can. I was speaking to somebody a while ago from Apple um, who made an interesting comment, which I've repeated since, but I thought, I wonder if that's true. Uh, what he said was this, that the most powerful computers on Earth at the moment have the processing power of the brain of a cricket. Now, I know that's a metaphor. I mean, I don't know any crickets. But, <laughs> you know, but his point was that, really, even the most powerful computers are tremendously rapid and sophisticated calculators. They're not thinking in any sense that we would be comfortable using the term. But, I think he said in, in five years or so, I know Ray Kurzweil has a whole series of possible thresholds, but he said within five years or so, the most powerful computers on Earth may have the processing power of a six-month-old child, six, a six-month-old baby. And that what he said about that was that, it, that they would be capable of learning. So tell me, I mean, where are we headed with this? I'm really interested to know. I want to take the opportunity while we're here. But Ray Kurzweil confidently says it was in 2020, we might be able to get a computer for $1,000 with the same processing power as a human brain. I mean, what, what's your, is there anybody who knows really about this in, in a way that you could comment? I'd be really interested. We Thank you. We don't really know how complicated neurons and synapses are yet. No. There's a lot of neuroscientists who think they know, but... They certainly don't. Yeah. But there's a convergence here, isn't it, between these technologies of neuroscience and um, information systems, a potential convergence. I mean, where, where do you... I mean, where do you see this headed in the next 10, 20 years? I don't want to put you on the spot. Does anybody have an opinion about it? I'm just really interested. See, it has massive implications for education. Massive. I understand the mechanisms of neuroplasticity, which is still a, a really novel concept. Yes, that's right. In brain science. Yes. Uh, and uh, there are several different centers that are really on the cutting edge of that. Of course, uh, 
uh, UMass in Wisconsin, uh, Richard Davidson's uh, laboratory, you know, he's doing uh, huge uh, research on the left frontal gyrus. Yeah. Uh, so, yes, I know his work, yeah. Yeah, yeah, he's phenomenal. Yeah. Um, and also, actually, right here in Seattle, um, the Allen Center for Brain Mapping, yes. which is pretty cool. Yes. Um, but um, underlying mechanisms have not really been fully understood. But if we, if we set aside the brain science for the moment, in terms of computing power and where these systems are headed, what do you see as the horizons in front of us? Yeah. I think probably the, uh, the thing that's emerging that's more like a brain structure are the interconnection patterns between people and between computers. So things more like the internet are much more like a brain than things like the central yes. process. Central processors are more like neurons, but the interconnection pattern. So even something as simple as Twitter, it can be used as sort of like a certain information flow. Yeah. You, know, you can you can see the internet thinking by watching yeah. the flow of, of connections through patterns like Twitter. Yeah. So things like the search engines, Bing, Google, those are really the places where the internet's thinking can be. And it's much more there than the actual hardware. Yeah. And there's, yeah, there's people, I mean, the, the intelligence isn't in the hardware. It's in the connection patterns between yeah. the different ideas yeah. and repositories of information and how those connections adapt and react to stimulus. Right? So you could, you could inject stimulus in some part of the internet and then harvest the response somewhere yeah. else. Yeah. And you know, as computing power and communications ramp up in technology, then the thinking power and the speed of thought in that collective gets bigger. But the interesting thing about the internet is it's more cybernetic. It's not just the interconnections. At those nodes, there's still wetware at every spot. So it can do deep thinking as well as sort of connected. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <clears throat> yes, please, yeah. I'm sure you address this in the book, and I haven't read it all yet. But um, what do you say when you talk about, you know, people's potential and uh, fulfillment and um, educational institutions and parents and communities at large, you know, steering people or allowing people to pursue what it is that they really get or what is in their element versus um, societal values or norms around earning a living, making money. How does this whole conception of, you know, having to be a a broker on Wall Street and earn two hundred thousand dollars a year in a moment. <clears throat> the values in society, I think, sometimes are skewed. If you look at, and people say this all the time: what a teacher is paid versus what a professional athlete mm -hmm. in, you know, in the NBA or in the NFL is paid. I mean, how do those kinds of things sort of, I would think, limit and, and start to close in the the universe of potential options that people mm -hmm. think that they want to be able to do well yeah. are going to pursue. Yeah. Well, I'll take a couple of quick things about this. One is that um, this, this thing about being in your element, I mean, it's a metaphor, you know, for a, a, a bigger argument, but it's not a, just about attitude and passion. It's also about attitude, you know. I, I interviewed lots of people for the book. Um, it was originally going to be a book of interviews, but we realized that wasn't as interesting as saying what it all meant. But uh, <clears throat> I interviewed lots of people. Um, and what they have in common is they had some sense that they, uh, they were determined to pursue a path of some sort. You know, they, they had the confidence to do it. I don't mean they've all led perfect lives, on the contrary. But they were driven by a, a kind of inner need to, to find what would fulfill them. And they were prepared to take whatever it took, to do whatever it took to make that happen. Um, they also, there were also mentors in almost everybody's life. Somebody who saw their talent often before they did, who helped them, like Bart's mum you know, um, who encouraged them in some way, or somebody they found inspirational. That was always a big factor. But there are lots of obstacles to this. You know, I mean, there are all kinds of things that get in the way. I have a chapter there called, What Will They Think? You know, um, I mean, they include our own fear. You know, our own fear of falling on our face, of looking ridiculous, our own self-image. Um, the inhibition that comes from other people's opinions of us. You know, our family, our friends, spouses, if we have them, you know. These can be forced for good or not. And a lot of people, I actually tell the story in the book, again, didn't talk to him, but of Paolo Coelho, the writer who wrote, wrote The Alchemist. His parents, when he was a kid in South America, 
were appalled that he wanted to be a writer. It's all he ever wanted to be. And they said he should be a lawyer. And he wanted to be a writer. And he persisted with what they thought was a kind of madness. And they had him committed three times to a mental institution for it, uh, where he had uh, a series of electroconvulsive therapies. And he eventually came out and still, and then wrote about the experience. You know, again. <laughs> so they kind of gave up at that point. Well, you know, not many parents go that far, you know, where they'll plug their kids into the mains, you know, but, uh, but it can be more subtle. It can be a raised eyebrow at the wrong moment, you know. Um, there are all kinds of ways. Now, I, I, it's very keen to say at the beginning of the this isn't a set of fairy tales. This is, you know, and I interviewed lots of people who are very well known. I interviewed Paul McCartney for the book and uh, uh, Mick Fleetwood, among others. Uh, and they're very interesting stories here. Paul McCartney, I'm from Liverpool, he was from Liverpool, and um, he went to school at, at the other side of the city. I didn't know him at that point. I've met him a bit since, but uh, I asked him if he enjoyed music at school, and he said he hated it. He said he went through it because it, it, it just the teacher just kept putting classical records on, and th that was music education. Uh, he said he went through the whole of his time at school, and nobody thought he had any musical talent at school. Uh, Paul McCartney, you know. Uh, one of the other people in the same music class was George Harrison. Same school, same class, a couple of years younger. And nobody thought he had any talent either for music. So I said to Paul McCartney, I said, so is this right that there was this one music teacher in Liverpool in the 50s who had half the Beatles in his class, you know? <laughs> and he missed it. He said, that would be right, yeah. Though he's very keen not to criticise him for it. But the analogy I make is this, sorry, is that is that human resources, talent, are like natural resources. They're often buried beneath the ground. You know, you have to go looking for them. It takes circumstances for them to surface. Like I often think, you know, of those four guys, you know, what would have happened if they hadn't met each other? I don't know. You know, what would have happened to Elvis Presley if Tom Parker hadn't picked him up? And you can go on, you know, if Bill Gates hadn't met Paul Allen, you know, I mean, it, seriously, you know, I mean, it, it's about opportunity and the confidence to take it or to create it. So I'm really keen to emphasize what you're saying, you know, to underline it, that it's not some fairy tale and some people are, have these God-given give, give gifts and some don't. In almost every case, what I've tried to do is to show the conditions under which it happened for them. And of course, the celebrities, you know, some of them in the book, were not born as celebrities. You know, they became celebrities because they pursued the thing that they wanted most to do. But there's a lot that gets in the way of it, if that's your point. Yeah. Yeah. I'm sorry. And I liked it very much. Thank you very much. Personally, I have a six-year-old daughter. And with your children, I mean, do you find, can the public school system here work for her if I give her the right, if I try to encourage her finding her element, finding her aptitude, or do I need to find... I mean, what did you do with your children? Did you find special schools for them that you thought were better, or did you just, you and your wife personally just... Well, actually, um, we moved our kids several times to different schools uh, because we didn't feel they were getting what they needed. And, and you don't feel like you could pro uh, help provide that? Oh, sure. I, th I, I, I hope that. we did. I, I think we did. You know, we, uh, my kids are 20 and 25, and... You know, I think we have a great relationship. I mean, they will tell you, I'm sure. Um, we do. I mean, they're great. But they're, the thing I'm... I, you've got one. Have, have any of you here got more than one child? OK, well, how, how about two? You've got two? You need at least two to answer this question. <laughs> Aunt, tell me if I'm right about this. My experience is that anybody who's got two children or more will tell you they are completely different sorts of people. Aren't they? Um, even identical twins are different. Their parents will tell you, oh, she's like this, she's like that, you know, well, don't mention that. No, they're different. And the problem in schools is that they are all put through the same program. And the intention is they should, in a way, turn out the same. But they're all different. And that's the central problem, that human life is about diversity and education is about conformity. And what I try and do, I work both ends of the street. I work a lot with education systems. I've done major national strategies. I work with politicians. Because I think the agriculture metaphor is really important. You know, 
The, uh, to take, another, take another analogy, it's in the book, you might know it. it uh, if you take the catering industry as a case in point, <coughs> in the catering industry, there are two methods of quality assurance. Uh, one of them is standardizing. And that's the process that drives the fast food industry. You know, so if you have a favorite fast food outlet, whichever one it is, um, no matter which one you go to, you know exactly what you're going to get. The same burger, same fries, same bun, same cup. It's all horrible, you know, but it's guaranteed. <laughs> Whereas, you know, if you go to a Michelin restaurant uh, or a Zagat restaurant, they're all much better and they're all different. And the reason is that in those restaurants, the people who endorse them don't say, this is what you should put on the menu. They say, these are the criteria of a great restaurant. You meet them any way you like. We don't care whether it's French, Italian, Asian food, don't care what time you open, what time you show, whether you serve wine or you don't. Meet these criteria and you're in the guide. And the result is that all these restaurants are great and they're all much better than fast food and they're all different. And they're different because they're customized and personalized. And I know great schools and they're all great because they're all different. It's like all the great orchestras, all the great bands, you know, all the great companies are great. They do the same things, but they are different. They're human. And what we've done in education is we've enforced the fast food model when we should be promoting the Michelin Guide. And what I always say to parents is, you work with the school and see if you can get the thing to change. All schools need great teachers and they need great principals. And there are great schools always, but like in the agriculture metaphor, they come and go. If you work in, the, in a manufacturing mode, you can think, well, we'll fix education once for all. There must be a silver bullet somewhere, and we'll just fix it, and it will go on forever. Every politician comes into office thinking, I know how to fix this. And they never do, because they apply the wrong ideology to it. The way you get education to improve is to improve every school in the country. And you do that by helping them improve themselves, not by trying to do it for them. You know, your, is it a daughter you have? You know, your interest as a parent in her. You may be vaguely interested in the way the country is performing in education, but she's your primary interest. It's true with our kids, you know. And once people get that, you know, that your daughter's experience of public education in America is that school that she's going to. That's the one. You know, our kids aren't going to school in the state rooms of the Beltway. They're going to school here in Seattle in that school. So fixing education means fixing that school for them. So you can work with that school. And we found with our kids, where we couldn't really do anything with the school, we moved the kids to somewhere else. We eventually took my daughter out of school completely when she was 16. Um, because it was killing her. We could see the light going out in her eyes. It had become a, an Ivy League factory. And we could, we could see the light dimming. Well, um, my, uh, she's in first grade. I'm, I'm happy with the school. Yeah, college. great. You're there twice a week. I go in. I, I help with the math test. Yeah. I see how it goes. I, I think it's going well great. so far. Yeah. yeah. And it may well continue to be great. There are wonderful schools around. And I'm not saying knocking the whole of education. And we're talking about education now because we can't talk about everything here today. Sure. Yeah, no, no, but, no, but I hope I'm making you vigilant. Okay. You know, that's all you need to be. You need to keep an eye on it and see that she's getting what she needs. And, and what she needs isn't always what she wants. You know? You know, there are some things that kids need to have you know, against their, their, their interests, but it's probably in their better interests. You know, I'm not saying that. Your job as a parent isn't just to facilitate everything they want to have. You, you've got to, you know that. You know. Yeah, let's just take one. Uh, uh, you, uh, yes, go on. So uh, on your example of the firemen, uh, I, I agree that the schools are driving towards you, uniformity and uh, a lot of standardization. But isn't that based on uh, kind of social norms of trying to prepare people for survival, income, things like that? Yeah. So the schools really aren't tasked with the ability of, or, or the responsibility of producing good environment or you know, the diversity that society really needs. It's just training people to get out there and get a, you know, a well-paying career and you know, get well, ready for college well, and the next step. Well, well that, you expressed the problem beautifully. Uh, the thing is, we need a country with firemen. You know, we need a country with people in the medical professions. We need a country with all the things that people love to do. And the point is just that the education system is predicated on a certain set of career paths. And everything else happens by accident and default. And I know brilliant people who go through it thinking they're not very smart because what they were smart at wasn't valued. But by the way, the reason I think it's relevant here is it's twofold. One is all these arguments apply equally in companies and organizations. 
But secondly, I think there is a massive opportunity, really, for companies like Microsoft to, to move the needle here because the future of education, as we're talking about it, will rely much, much more on the creative use of technologies and information systems than at any time. Your work, actually, particularly the work of Microsoft, has triggered much of this revolution. And it's changed the whole game. Uh, it's changed the way kids think. It's changed how they communicate. It's changed how they get information. It's changed how they relate to each other. It's changed the whole culture in less than 25 years. And it's helped to make our current systems of education obsolete. <coughs> the roles of teachers when we went to school were to tell you stuff you couldn't find out in part. And now, most kids are far more adept at finding stuff out than their teachers are. But their teachers can be tremendously supportive as kind of curators, as guides, as mentors, but they need help. And I think that the only thing that ever improves education is making teaching more effective and more powerful. But the opportunities to come up with um, new ways of teaching, new ways of thinking, new ways of accessing ideas, new creative platforms, in education, I think that's the next killer app. I really do. Education is like the biggest business on earth. And this generation is hungry to learn. I have great confidence in this generation. But what they come into school with now are all the skills of digital natives. And a lot of what happens in school is just boring for them. It's their minds are moving at the speeds that you've now created for them. And they aren't interested in the ordinary run of things that goes on. I don't mean to say all education should be mediated through digital technology, but at the moment it kind of limps along the side of education, alongside this broken system. And I think if that the opportunity to create new learning platforms, new ways of interacting with uh, digital materials is the next big horizon. I really do, and I, I, I hope there are people here working on that because <coughs> it seems to me, A, essential for the effectiveness of education, B, it, it's, um, it's already proven as an extraordinary learning resource, and, and A, and C, there's a massive prize out there you know, to get this right. We should stop there, shouldn't we? But thank you for staying. Thank you. <clears throat>